Neil Haynes. Present. Harold Jorgensen. Present. Kristen Moen. Present. Robert Schiller. Yep. Jason Alders. Present. Kelly Piero. Here. Liz Stockman. Here. Mary Wagner. Jeff Pino. Okay, we're going to, the next thing we're going to have her do is read the meeting policy. The agenda as printed or amended will be followed, so all necessary and needed actions by the Planning and Zoning Commission will be addressed. The agenda can be amended by proper motion. Business from the floor is welcome and allotted on our agenda. When comments from the floor are made, you must first be recognized by the chairman, second, state your name and address for the record, and third, you will have no more than three minutes to state your comments or concerns. Copies of the agenda are available on the back table, and there's a sign-in sheet and another sign-up sheet for floor items if you'd like to speak. Please turn all cell phones off. Okay, the first thing that we're going to do now is approve or amend tonight's meeting agenda of June 26, 2018. Somebody like to make this motion? I'll make the motion to approve the uh, agenda for tonight. Commissioner Alder made the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Commissioner Schiller seconded. Are there any questions about this? Any about this? If not, call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the first item on our agenda is a conceptual subdivision plan by Mark and Michelle Coates of 19335 Burn. Parkway Northwest, pin numbers 29-33-25-41-004, uh, and also 29-33-25-41-006, uh, and also 29-33-25-41-008. It's discuss discussion of a minor <coughs> subdivision in concept. The first thing we're going to do is ask our Tyler uh, Stockman to present what <clears throat> she Thank has. You. Um, for the record, uh, clerk, I just want to make a note that uh, parcel number that ends in 008 should be 14-0008, um, not 41. So Mark and Michelle, and correct me if I'm wrong, Coach, Coach, Coach. Coach. Um, are proposing three new lots on their 44.8 acre property. They currently have three lots. Uh, they're basically going to reconfigure, keeping um, keeping the existing flag lot for themselves. So they have are uh, here off of Burns Parkway near Nowland Boulevard. And this again shows the location on the aerial photograph. So this lot number one is where they currently reside. The remaining land here, lots two and three, are vacant. There's a large wetland on the southern portion of this lot. So what they're proposing to do is use the frontage they have on Burns Parkway and provide three new lots here, taking advantage of uh, the depth they have. He's not interested in installing any type of a street or cul-de-sac to maximize lots, you know, at the two and a half acre size. He just wants to use the frontage he has on Burns Parkway. So here's the existing flag lot. He's got 33 feet that he owns out to the road. There's a little glitch up here, as I indicated on the concept plan where this triangle lot basically cuts off direct access to Burns Parkway, but that can all be resolved under the proposed split and via the survey and all the recorded documents. So he is in the process of having soil borings done and um, surveying, so, and also wetland delineation. Uh, so we're looking for your comments, any thoughts you might have. Um, he mentioned to me that this piece in the back here that's all wet, um, there's a, he may want to reconfigure these two lots 
and instead have the middle lot kind of be an L shape to take advantage of a um, nice high spot here where you could have a nice walkout lot. So either way, the frontage would be very similar. They're all 300 feet wide along Burns Parkway. Uh, you would have to dedicate right away for Burns Parkway. It's a prescriptive easement there right now. And there's really no chance of going south here through this wetland, so we're not concerned with street connections at all. Uh, the corner in the very southeast corner could potentially be split later as this cul-de-sac could be extended down through this 40-acre piece. Uh, but for now, that's just going to stay as it is a part of his... <coughs> actually, well, not as it is because it'll be combined with his five-acre piece he's got now. <coughs> so if there are any questions or comments, we'd be open to hearing those. Uh, before he finalizes all the plans, then he would have to come back before you uh, either next month or whenever he's ready to go. Is there a proposed uh, trail along that road there? Yeah, the park and trail dedication we could talk about, um, and that's why I included the park and trail map as part of the demo. <clears throat> uh, right here is shown a trail on our park and trail plan. You do have the ability to require 20 feet of right away for that trail and that there's a formula you know if he were to dedicate the land for that trail there is a formula by which you determine the value and you know compare that to what the cash donation would be and um, you know figure out what the, the uh, dedication would be in terms of park and or trail so what we would do would be to work out that formula as part of the review for the when the actual surveys come in and the formal application for the split. And then at that time we would make the call. You can indicate whether you feel that's favorable or not favorable at this time. Um, this pink line you see, the pink dotted line on our trails map is actually indicating just an arrangement of local streets that we use for trail access. Um, so basically, uh, the trail along Burns Parkway then would be connecting this local street access up to another, you know, regional or, or uh, off-street trail potentially along Nowlin Boulevard. We currently do not have, as you know, a trail along Nowlin Boulevard. We don't have a recommendation from the park and rec then. No, no, they will get the actual survey um, and they can, if they have a meeting, they are, um, may chime in on it and give a recommendation to the city council just as you do. If we ask for this trail, we ask for this in lieu of the park and uh, trail fund payment? Well, right, we would evaluate. So let's say you ask for a 20 foot wide you know, strip of dedicated land. We, there is a calculation for determining what its value is, and then we compare that to the 2500 We have a $2,000 park fee and a $500 trail fee, so $2,500 um, for at least two of those lots. Um, that's another thing that we could discuss. I mean, technically they are all new lots because they have new descriptions, but he actually owns three lots now. So I'm guessing there should be some sort of uh, maybe compromise, and this can all be worked out. 
once you decide what you would like to see for dedication, whether you want that land or whether you want the cash for the park dedication. The question I have, what if the value doesn't equal what we have, we're asking for? Well, then you can, you can ask for part land and part cash at any time, too. So let's say, you know, 2,500 times three is uh, 7,500. So let's say the land is worth 5,000. You can ask for the rest of it in cash. Because I, I, we understand there's about 900 feet in front of the property there. It's at, on Boone's Parkway, right? Mm -hmm. That's a good estimate, yes. And land right now is, I believe, about between 5,000 and 6,000 an acre. So that, and you know, I don't know if that would be used as an official number, but talk to the attorney about um, how they, you know, where they get their numbers from. That particular number that I just stated just came from talking with recent sales of vacant land, talking to realtors. So don't uh, quote me on that value per acre. In other words, the city would have to pay the difference if it was higher? Mm, no, the city wouldn't pay itself. So you're... I'm saying if it goes over 2,500, the, the value, they feel the value is more than, the land's worth more than that, the 20 feet, 20 feet. If the land, I'm not following you, Dale. Okay. We'd be asking for 20 feet. 20 feet. 20 oh. feet. And say the value ends up over $2,500, what happens then? You mean per lot? Oh, that's, oh, I'm, I got, I'm, I'm thinking, no, you'd have 7,500. So, yeah, they're... Or, I have no idea. I guess at this point I have no idea what the value is going to be of that 20 feet. He has to donate or dedicate right of way for the street. Um, you know, the lots are very deep. I don't think, you know, I mean, I do think it's reasonable to consider asking for an additional 20 feet for a trail. It's just all on what you want to see. I mean, uh, I think for the actual uh, review of the subdivision and the survey, we should take a look, you know, in more detail at both sides of Burns Parkway because maybe it doesn't make sense to have the trail on his side of Burns Parkway. You know, that is the kind of thing that we also need to evaluate. But if you get down just a little further where that park is through there, that's all low ground in there. You couldn't hardly put anything in there. Is that past this area that we're yeah, showing past, there? Past, just past that, yes. Yeah, which is pr probably why we didn't show the trail all the way. But this is this is close to, out here to the... Uh, it, there's only about two houses in between that, isn't there? Being out here in the main drag. And, and a lot of people are on that road. There's a lot of people walking. There's a lot of people, uh, or even riding horseback. You wouldn't want horses there, but there's a lot of people walks that and bicycles that. Right. There are people that use the shoulders for sure. And um, another thing to keep in mind here is that you've got these regional trails that are right at this intersection. So it is nice to provide kind of the funneling effect or the connections up to those regional trails. The one is planned to go along Old Viking Boulevard and then transitions over here to Viking and then it goes north on Nowland Boulevard up through St. Francis. My personal opinion is I think we should be asking for that 20 feet on all, all three lots. So if we, he has three lots now. I mean, the smallest one that he resides on here, you know, is, a, is already a five acre piece, but in some ways, it's just a reconfiguration, but in other ways, you know, we, we're going to gain three homes in the city, so asking for, um, 
it's reasonable to for sure ask for two and maybe all three uh, for park dedication based on the, the new homes and the added, you know, increase in population, the added users to our park and trail system, et cetera. But that is for you to rec make a recommendation and for the city council to decide what ultimately happens there. <clears throat> What's the feeling, rest of the commission? That real estate only comes out to less than half an acre, though. Less than a half an acre. Yeah, 20, 20 feet. Yeah, if you got a nine, if you got nine hundred feet there, you can think of that. Too. There's eighteen thousand square feet, and you got forty three five sixty per an acre, so you don't even have a half. So you're much better off with the money. And you got the other fact is that when you're going down that road. It cannot be extended without a lot of money being spent. It's going to it's going to twilight right at the end of Hedgehog. There. You look at that. And that's all the way along through there. It's not a good road even to work on. No, it's a very poor road. It's yeah, and the traffic's terrible. See the there. the thing is, we have been told in the past that that road was going to go revert to the city eventually. So we'll have that there contend with too as far as to to rebuild because that ain't gonna last forever going from hump to hump there. But that's not a choice piece of uh, road as far as I'm concerned. You don't want to be a drinking guy and live on that one. Because <laughs> it's easy to come around them curves and But I mean, if you're going to look at the math or, or, or the real estate, but where's it going to go after that? That's the problem. Well, Because they don't do any good. It's just going to be good for them three houses and maybe a couple more, and that's it. I think it's too low. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of low in there. Because mm -hmm. there's a, that creek runs right along the further west there on that side. It actually runs right along the, side of the road for quite a ways there. Yeah, it's old man Moose's pasture is what it was. Yeah. So that's where you got to figure out which way is. You know what I mean? But should you should have should you be on the other side of the road or should you take the cash and, and do something else with it? You know. But if you go on the other side of the road, you get up there by that park, and that's all low through there. There's no way. But you it can... ain't near as bad as the other side. No. There is a little bit more dirt over there. If you look at it good. Okay, you could still ask for a, a, a trail and that could eventually revert back if you didn't put a trail in there, so. Yeah, correct. I, I, I personally, as, as I look at it, you got the, these other trails right out here in the main drag and there's gonna be people, a lot of people walking out there. It's right close to downtown here. There. What, Commissioner Pearl? Um, you guys referred to this um, street as being kind of a windy, dangerous street. Um, that's one of the things we need to fix. So, getting the land is probably going to help us to try to widen the road, make it a little bit more visible. My one question I have that I somehow I must have missed or didn't quite follow correctly is. The 75 feet that we're getting from the center line on your notation here, mm -hmm. does that include the 20 feet or is it an additional 20 feet on top of that? In addition to the 75. It would be. Okay. So what we're seeing on your uh, left side there, some of the properties have already um, been pushed out to that 75 mark. And some right. are not. Right. The ones that were subdivided in more recent history have already dedicated. Okay. Um, now that's, you know, what the county's requiring now. And, you know, like you say, we do not have that width all the way along yet. Yep. Uh, many times, depending on the stretch or the turn lanes situation, you know, that 75 feet could accommodate a trail. 
and you know whether or not we actually need the extra 20 feet would remain to be seen but if we do have to do a lot of grading or any wetland fill then it's nice to have that extra <coughs> With that 75 feet that obviously is being um, required to to uh, to split this lot up, um, that changes that flag lot to be basically right in the right of way, so we don't have to deal with regranting uh, land there. Do we have that corner? No, no, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're, it'll kind of work itself out as we um, draw the lot lines for the proposed subdivision. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing to note is that, you know, the property owner directly to the east has another 33 feet there, but because he has 40 acres to the south um, of the current applicant, but... He'll never use that. We don't need a road to go through there with that large wetland. Uh, we could, that could eventually be vacated um, as well, but who knows? I mean, that could someday possibly be a trail connection, uh, which might be nice. But for now, um, in order to vacate all that, I mean, we'd have to include his it is a, an owned strip, it's not an easement, so we'd have to include the 40 acres to the south in the plat, and that gets expensive, so we're just not gonna deal with that right now. Liz, the existing lots with the new lots for all the, the minimum 300 feet wide at the, at the road access? Yes, well, he has the a width, proper width to, to meet all that. Does the applicant want to make any comments to this? Uh, as far as the little piece for the, you're wondering about the little piece where the driveway doesn't meet the road. Mm -hmm. I actually own a piece on the other side of the road, so I mean, I can donate that to the city and then there shouldn't be an issue there. Great for the on the other side of the road, the actual survey, I own that little pie there. Oh, you own this little triangle? Well, yeah. little point. Oh, okay. So that's, I mean, I don't know how it never connected, I guess. I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, we'll work it out when we see the official survey. I don't think it's going to yeah. be a problem. No, yeah, yeah. And if it's just a little remnant, usually uh, they you dedicate it as part of the right of way or something. Yeah. And as far as the trail, like riding bikes, is that what you're thinking, or horses or stuff? Well, uh, it wouldn't be for horses. It'd be for bikes and people walking. walking. People walking. It's, uh, it really isn't a friendly road for a trail. This guy here said that open videos, but you would actually actually have to drive it slow and, and check both sides. It's not a, as far as the trail goes, it's not a friendly road. But I mean, if that's what we require, that's all I have to do. It's a very dangerous road. It can be, and when he says, as far as people drink it, it's, it's not even a drinking issue, which you're not supposed to do anyway. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just the speed. Everybody likes to ride the motorcycles fast or their hot rod cars. So they're, but you know, when the cops sit down there, they get their quotas in a quick hurry and people take alternate routes. So yeah, it is what it is. It's okay. Do we have any more discussion on the, the, that part of it? Is there is something else we should be look, looking at here? Uh, Those were the main issues, um, park dedication. So for now, you're recommending that maybe we start off, he shows 20 feet, an extra 20 feet. We'll see how that lays out. And 
Or yeah. how do you, what's well, the consensus? That, that, that's what I'd make a recommendation to him. I mean, if like uh, Commissioner Jorgensen said, it's less than a half an acre, so you still are getting some cash, about two-thirds cash, and, you know, and then the land. Um, what's your feeling on the number of lots that he should be? I'd say in all of them. Dedication. I'd say, I'd say in all of them. I like the 20 feet on all of them, but not the money on the third one. Because he's already, there is already one lot there to begin with, and he's just adding two, basically. Well, they, they, they classify it as three lots, though, so, because it's a minor subdivision. Well, he's got four total, so. Yeah, he's got, yeah, he's got three today. Yeah. So but, he's, only, he's adding one, right? <clears throat> he can't do anything with just one. One is really parts. landlocked. So, I mean, he really has one buildable parcel plus the one he's on. So, like I said, I, I think either two or three would be fair. It would be two at the minimum I would recommend. But it is three new houses if you look at it that way. And that's something he's pretty much going to pass through to the buyers anyway. But like I said before, it doesn't have to be built. It's just there in case you ever wanted it. Well, right. And, and like I said, I can get some more details on, you know, which side may be more appropriate if you chose to um, have the city engineer take a quick look at it. You know, we could provide topography maps and those kind of things to, to help you see if or understand whether or not this side is, makes any sense at all. But road, it, uh, trails can pop from one side to the other, too. Yep, they can. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be on one side. No, but the concern would be there, again, if it's a curvy, you know, narrow road, you don't want people uh, crossing back and forth and... As you know from years of driving, uh, people are kind of iffy about stopping for crosswalks and, you know, unless they're really well marked. Is there anything else we need to add here? And if there's none, I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion myself that we recommend that we go with the, 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 the three lots. 20 feet for the uh, park and rec trail. Do we have a second this motion? I'll second it. Okay, Commissioner uh, Mullen made the second. Do we have any discussion now? Do we have any discussion? Seeing then I'll call for the vote. All in favor of this motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, and they're, they're, they're going to get the, they'll be back in and have a public hearing on this, right, uh, Liz? Yep, they'll be back, uh, hopefully July or August. Uh, the surveyor comes this week. Okay, well, good. Great. And this Thank will, you. This will be uh, t taken up at the next uh, workshop meeting, right? Uh, no, the concept plans don't go to the city council. <coughs> they don't go to the city council at all. Okay. Okay. Okay, then we'll go to our, our next concept subdivision plan. Mike and Mike, Breed, 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 Breedy, Breedy, and Greg begin of 18953 Jasper Street, Northwest, pin number 27-33-25-34-0015. Discussion of a three-lot split concept. Uh, Connor Stockman, turn over to you. Okay, so this is kind of a unique situation. Um, it's a 10-acre parcel. It is nestled um, it's on Jasper Street in the southern part of Nalman. it's nestled in with um, a whole subdivision that was done 
in the early 70s, it was not platted, so all those small lots were meets and bounds lots. All the roads are prescriptive easements, um, meaning that this 10 acres was not part of the plat. It was um, not needed for the average to meet any lot minimums or you know density calculations. So it makes some sense to allow the property owner rights, um, the ability to develop or to split here. Uh, he plans to remove the existing farmhouse and um, build a home for himself. And then the second smaller lot he would like to have for his mother. Now the this shows the development density in the region here. These being 40 acre parcels and just gives you an idea of how many lots we have with our current density requirement of eight per 40. Um, the, we have across the street two 20 acre pieces, most of which are undevelopable. And then the other 40 to the south of that is at least half undevelopable. And this one here is fully developed. Um, and this one is more than eight per 40 based on that older subdivision. Um, but it's not unreasonable to consider um, a lot split. It would just be two lots. Um, he, his preference would be to go with a smaller lot up in one of the corners um, as concepts one and two show. And he, there's a pond sort of in the back middle here which would be at the back of either lot, concept one or two. Um, he of course would have to show buildability, um, a primary and a secondary backup, a septic site, and all the other requirements in our subdivision ordinance. Uh, he, the only thing that you could vary here is the lot size. And concept three is a third option where you've got two and a half acres. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in that configuration. You could include the pond and then angle a line up toward 100 and, uh, what is that, 90th. Now, so if he platted this, he'd have to plat it either way. If he's going to do a two and a half acre lot or less, um, you know, or anything less than the five acres, he has to plat it. So um, it really, you know, it's up to you whether you want him to meet this minimum of two and a half or whether you'd consider going lower in, in lot size based on the existing neighborhood and the layout of those lots that surround him. Uh, let's see. There are no trails shown in this area. This is just one small wetland uh, that he would need to delineate in the back part of that property. And that is it. So. There are no trails along these three side streets. I forget, were you, which way were you thinking you'd want to access with your new driveway? The same, the same driveway access onto 189th, is it, lane? Or he currently, or the house currently goes right out to Jasper? Either or. Doesn't matter. Probably come to the south or keep it interesting. So, you know, think about the variance criteria again, which I outlined in the ordinance. Um, when we have unique circumstances, we can consider a variance to our current code. Uh, we don't ever consider use variances, which would be a, a change in the use of the property but we do allow variances in terms of lot size or width or setback type variances. Um, 
it is up to you. I guess I'd like to hear some conversation relative to um, whether you want him to meet that two and a half acre minimum or whether you'd be willing to go slightly smaller. Again, he would have to prove that, you know, a one and a half or a two acre lot would work on the site and work with our buildability requirements. And he again would come back um, through you, uh, especially if the variants were required. That would be a public hearing. This whole development was put in before we had an ordinance. Um, correct. And so our ordinance says right now you have to have two and a half acres. But. Right. Is the so, minimum as part of a yes. plat. Right. It has to be platted to get a two and a half acre lot. But the rest that was platted and that wasn't part of the plat, so I don't see where it has anything to do with the rest, rest set there. The rest of it was not platted. It was subdivided by meets and bounds in 1971. But that would be illegal now. So why would we want him to have, have a smaller lot in two and a half acres? No, you don't have to. He's, uh, but he's asking for some deviation based on the uniqueness of the neighborhood and the fact that he's abutting these smaller lots. Just because they did something wrong in the 70s doesn't necessarily mean it's something right today, though. You know, if we've got something already down at two and a half acres, I guess, I, don't, I, I would, I'd There's have no, a problem with changing it now. There's no hardship, okay. right? Right. Okay. Does concept three meet the uh, three and a foot minimum width requirement? Concept three, well, we'd, we'd make sure that it did. Um, you know, unless if he could get two and a half acres across the back like that, uh, would let's see, I'm not sure. I don't know if you'd consider a lot width requirement or if you want him to meet all aspects of the code as anybody else would need to do. Um, he does have to dedicate right away on three sides. It is a little little bit of a burden that he's losing land on three sides when he can only get two lots out of it. But, I mean, that's, I guess he's aware of that and... Yeah, he may be losing it, but he can still use it. No, he can't use it. It's, it becomes right away. It's, you know, it's right away, but you can still, you can mow the grass and everything else in the right away. Well, you have to take care of it. Yeah. That, yeah, that you have to take care of it in the public right away. But, you know, you, you know, setbacks and everything would negate any use of it for structures, of course. And any fence line would have to be 33 feet back from the center of the road. So they're all local streets. And you think he could meet that two and a half acres? Well, I know he could one way or the other. I'm just not sure if he if he meets the, I can't remember what the width is here. Let's see. I can't read it. And on, you, on one of them, it's written at 670 by, it looks like 600. 160, in it, by 600? No, the full thing, it looks like it's a oh, 670 okay. by 600. 670 along that back line? Yeah. I think if he were, you know, we only require 150 feet of street frontage, but we need 300 foot width for the at the building setback line. So, you know, when you're working with rectangles, it's usually just as easy to have a, you know, 300 foot width all the way across. I mean, it's not saying he, he could angle it. Um, if you go, if he, 
creates a lot like concept three. Then he has, you know, streets on two sides of this lot, two sides of this lot. You know, so people can see into the rear yard basically from both sides. One side is the front and one side is the rear. Um, but, you know, with the trees there, and you could buffer it. So if you want the full 300 feet, I'm thinking that he's, it's probably going to be a little larger than two and a half acres. <clears throat> but he could, he could uh, <clears throat> meet the requirements with a option one type of layout, right? That's 300 feet wide and goes back two and a half acres, and then his other lot would have would be like a that L shape, you know. No, these here are smaller lots. I realize that, but he oh. wouldn't need to. If it was 300 feet wide, it wouldn't need to go the full length of his property, right? Oh, right. Yes. So yeah. I guess my recommendation is why would we not set it up that it meets our current code and it has to be 300 feet wide and it has to be at least two and a half acres and present a concept that looks like that. Okay. Yeah, the only other consideration is the barn here that wants to save. So as long as this new lot line is 20 feet away from that barn. But he could go up in the other corner if he wanted to, yep, right? Yep, he could do that too. Yep. He could play, make it so this pond is at the back of the lot and then right. angle the line up this way or something. And you still would have a nice setback from, you know, the new lot line. How would that work for driveways then? Would you end up with driveways on opposite ends of the lot? Um... Would, it would be okay because they're all local streets, so you could have a driveway on any of them, really. And then this one sounds like he he would be allowed to if he's on a corner like that. I'm, I'm sorry, did, are you Mike or Greg? Okay. Mike, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, my question to you is, I wanted to know. You guys drew up these concepts? Right. Okay. So which one is the one that you really wanted or you want to see? What's the one that's more favorable to you? If, if I was going to split, I'm not saying that I, I would, but if I was going to do it, I'd prefer option one or two. I mean, I, I, For the placement? I would like to keep most of the 10 acres intact, but I was just going off of like this uh, pre-existing subdivisions. I realize that the, the minimum is two and a half acres. Um, I prefer not to do that on the possible. Um, and I, if I was going to split it, I would prefer to do option one or two, but I'll go and see that decision. Well, no, I meant, that's what I meant by which concept is it that you like more um, for the placement of a lot if you did split it? Um, option one would probably be ideal. This is because your mother would be living there or something? Or, right. Well, I, that's understandable, but we've got to think about the future, too. Uh, uh, when, when, you, when you both aren't there anymore, we've got to look at, the, look at that standpoint, too. If we change this two-and-a-half-acre lot size for you, well, then all of a sudden everybody else can come in here and say, hey, listen, well, they did it here, you know. Where's the hardship? Well, how do you explain that? Right next to it are 1.25. So you have something that looks identical other than the one where his home is sitting on. But that's one reason why we got our got an ordinance now, is because of developments like that. Um, I believe there's a house for sale down at the end of the, one of those roads. 189th, maybe? What? But in the cul de sac? Yeah. No. Isn't there a house for sale down there in the cul de sac? There was, there was one that was vacant for quite some time. I, I think it's still. Is it finally sold? I think it's sold. Finally? Okay. Yeah. So, um, 
I'm just, it, I, my concern is, is that that is a 1.4 acre or whatever it was, 1.3 acres, and it was, it was, it took forever for it to sell. That creates a hardship for them when they go to a smaller lot size than what we require as a city right now. And that would be my concern is deviating from our ordinances right now to create what they want. Um, I, if we can, if we can give him concept one, but still meeting our requirements for the 300, um, 300 feet minimum without intruding into the barn that they're currently wanting to keep, then yes, with the two, eight, two and a half point, you know, two and a half acres and the 300 foot minimum on road frontage, then yes, let's, let's try to do concept one. If it gets into the barn, then yeah, we would have to go into more like the concept two where it's in the back opposing corner and still meet the two and a half acre requirement with the 300 foot um, minimum on road frontage. But would you want your barn that close to your house? Yes, why well, wouldn't you? Uh, that's what they're asking for, so I don't know. I would not want my barn that close to the house. Okay. No. But, but, Too many but flies. Why, why can't you put an angle up there and have their 300 feet coming in on the street above there instead of down by the barn there? Why, yeah, you could. Why, why can't you just put an angle there? On the 191st. Yeah, and, and that'd be the, uh, the 300 feet would be up there at the top. You'd take care of it by just widening out the, the entrance up on the yeah, top. Yeah, make it wider up the front and then narrow down. Are you talking on concept two? Yep. Oh, okay. Because according to their numbers, I mean, based on the dimensions on everything here, that uh, north, uh, east west line up there is about, it says 688 on the plat, take off 33 feet, you know, it's 655. So half of that would be almost the 300 feet. <clears throat> I mean, mm -hmm. do we need to be super prescriptive? I think the <coughs> recommendation is it has to be 300 feet wide and it has to be 2.5 acres, and you can split it up on your 10 acre lot or you want. want. Yeah. It meets our setbacks with buildings. And meet the setbacks. Yeah. Someone like to make that motion? I'll make the motion to follow the existing ordinances of a 300 foot wide lot in a middle of 2.5 acres. Commissioner, Wait, Commissioner yeah. Alders, Alders made the motion. Who, I'll second that. Oh. Commissioner uh, uh, Schiller seconded. Any further discussion? Uh, we're also adding the setbacks that we meet all building right, setbacks. Yes. Right, everything. The 300 feet plus the two and a half acres. Just want to make a comment that, yeah, I mean, less the right away that would be dedicated, he's got about eight and a half acres. If you take a two and a half acre lot out of that, he's still left with about a six and six acre lot, um, you know, for the current buildings. And I'm not sure what you know your thoughts were for using the property, but especially if your mother owns it, you could certainly have fencing that crossed the property line. You know, if you were going to contain animals or something like that, that would not be an issue. But just the you know structures is what we got to keep separate. Just want to make that comment. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. So we don't care how you put it so you have your 300 feet and two and a half acres. Uh, but we give you some ideas to work with. Well, give me a call if you have any questions or thoughts. Thank you. And okay, we'll go on here. We'll uh, continue on the other plan that we're working on. Uh, just continue the discussion and consider adopting a, an ordinance to regulate small cell, cell wireless network installed in public right of ways, on public owned buildings, and on commercially zoned property. So we'll turn it.
over to our planner, Stockman. Can I, did we ever take care of floor items? Did, did we? No, that's what I'm asking. There wasn't anything. Okay. There wasn't anything. Just want to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of information again with the uh, cell technology memo. So what I did find out was that we, well, let's, let me start by saying at the end of the last meeting, we had talked about possibly using uh, a light pole type structure, which could be possibly shared with street signs, um, street lights, the actual um, antenna for the small cell and, you know, possibly um, even the sirens for tornadoes, anything else, you know. So these, these light pole structures are very typical. Um, there have been cities that have designated how they look, how high they are, uh, how far apart they're placed. And as you can see by the attachments, there are lots of ways to conceal them, making them look like other things, whether it be a actual street pole or a windmill, a church steeple. Steeple, they can go on top of buildings, all sorts of different locations. They can, um, users can co-locate on them, although it seems to be more common that users do not co-locate. I'm not sure why that is at this time. Um, let's see. So maybe if we want to, we could just go through. Um, the memo and the things that I found out, and you could comment on those different aspects of the um, design. Unless you have some other ideas on how you want to proceed, but there's a lot of information here. Um, there, in item number one, the, there was a question about examples of ordinances from rural areas. I did get some samples from Jordan and Cocado. Um, those ordinances weren't a lot different than more suburban ordinances from Oakdale, you know, and Rochester, for instance. So not a lot of differenti differentiation. I did see, I, I would say most of them did follow the league example fairly fairly closely, and they were all fairly similar. Uh, they did vary in height between about 30 and 100 feet. You know, the, the big cell towers are usually between 100 and 200 feet high. I had a lot of trouble finding anyone local that could comment on this. Um, Commissioner Schiller had recommended Oakdale, and they were nice enough to direct me to the, their sample ordinance that they had adopted. But I talked to both the city planner and the engineer there, and they swear there, there's not small cell technology being installed there. And um, didn't get a return call from that contractor. So anyway, it was kind of a struggle to find information, but um, because they are smaller than your typical cell tower, they are closer together, um, and that's the intent. So they're shorter and they're closer together than the big towers. Um, the advantage is that, you know, you can uh, place them 
you know, in a low area or on a peak versus, you know, if you have one tall tower in the kind of the reception, thinking of the reception range as being a straight line, it doesn't get in those valleys where we've all experienced driving on a road where you, you know, have a lot of tree cover or you go down into a valley and you lose reception. So from the sounds of it, a lot of the contractors are favoring these smaller towers that are closer together and um, provide better reception to people on the ground, particularly in more densely populated areas. Um, so, in, you know, in, in the people I did speak with, they didn't see it as a real huge concern for a community like Nowlin, which is fairly rural. But if you get into a, an actual downtown uh, setting with higher buildings, you know, a lot of concrete, it becomes more critical to have these, you know, on every block. Um, we do have some, you know, with our many coal buildings, we do have some reception issues, um, just given the metal structures, um, but those are more appropriate, you know, more appropriately solved by um, what's also part of the small cell technology, but just for a single user, uh, you know, on a specific private property. So they're still called small cell, whether it's just on a residential property or whether it's, you know, maybe let's say in our downtown area. Um, let's see, Heights again. Cocado, Jordan, Oakdale had a height limit of 50 feet. Uh, they did allow replacement of higher wireless structures that may already exist. Underground use was not recommended at all for Minnesota. And just generally, the reception is not as good. So unless it's really in an area where aesthetics is an issue and you're trying to hide the antenna, um, they did not recommend underground application or concealment. A couple of the ordinances did re reference stealth or concealment requirements, meaning that they had to be concealed uh, in a certain manner. They could not just be an antenna mounted anywhere. So. And strategies um, covering cities such as now then you know at this time with our more rural nature the recommendation would typically be um, stick with the taller cell towers which cover a larger area um, if, we, if we want to establish some sort of an ordinance for you know part of the city or maybe in areas where reception is notably bad, uh, we could certainly do so. We could also have different regulations for residential areas versus our city center. And there could be different heights in that scenario as well. In other words, when you have people um, walking you know, around where the businesses are and such, typically your light poles are shorter and more to scale of a pedestrian uh, users. When you're out in the rural areas or residential areas, you would typically have a higher light pole um, that broadcasts more light 
over a larger area and that are more um, in tune with lighting an intersection, you know, <coughs> like the counties do or um, making visibility better for driving. But we could still coordinate you know, those poles with uh, antenna placement. So in researching it, I saw all sorts of different uh, materials used. Uh, wood poles were used, but probably most commonly were metal poles that were designed and painted a certain color that all coordinated. And um, I would say most people did try to have the poles be multi-use, whether it be for street signs or lights or um, whatever else, or a lot of times banners, you know, in downtown areas. So, um, Lastly, you know, we still require some underground utilities to be served to all the, all the antenna poles. Certainly, if they're going to be used for lights, you know, we have electric, we have fiber optic um, that goes underground, and then just the antenna itself is mounted at the top of the pole. So on page four, that gives you an idea of the different small cell technologies, um, basically based on service area or outdoor coverage. And some of those, like the Femto or the Wi-Fi, are more appropriate to private uses. And then you get into the micro or macro small cell, which would be used for Uh, city use, most likely. Page five just shows a a street light in a city center area uh, that is an antenna as well as a street light. And a lot of the poles have a bigger base where you can conceal some of the other electrical equipment within that base. There are some cities that allow um, poles to be shared with traffic lights and others that don't, sh don't allow sharing with a traffic light. Page six and seven are from the Stealth Company which just show different examples of ways to conceal the antenna. And that is actually what this company specializes in, which is why they are referenced in a couple different ordinance examples that I found. And page eight is showing just different styles of light poles. Um, the shape, you know, they're typically sort of a canister shape, a columnar, um, but they don't have to be. You can have contemporary look, you can have more traditional looking. And just about any you know color you can think of. So on page nine, it's showing the actual antenna on the top itself is measures about twenty seven inches tall. and is about 24 feet off the ground. And then the lights are 
lights are about two thirds of that. So probably 16 feet off the ground. And then one thing I liked on page 10 was um, as part of the applications for these, it's very helpful when the providers take a picture of the street or location where these poles are going to go or where the antennas are going to go, and then they superimpose what their um, design is so that the city, you know, governing body gets a good idea, a nice visual of how this will look within the street right of way. I think that's an important thing to include. Um, similar to how you've seen um, sign companies superimpose a, a new sign on a, the facade of a building. So, any thoughts, questions? The city of, uh, I think it was Cincinnati, had the most unique on the very end of the packet with the, the art boxes, page 14 and 15. They actually developed a specific box that contained the antenna and all the electrical equipment. And they would allow different sponsoring companies to design those. No chance of no then. <laughs> Unless it serves alcohol. I was going to say, <laughs> everyone's going to have to support it. Hey, there is that. Where are we at at this? What are we... Trying to copy from. We want to get a draft ordinance started. Well, that would be, I guess, the next step. Um, yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's a fairly simple concept, but in all the ordinances I looked at, I mean, they're between ten and twenty pages long. But a lot of that is, you know, all the details about regarding the location and, you know liability and where things can be placed and whether others can co-locate or not and so there's I guess even though it seems like it's fairly elementary I mean I think there's a lot to think about and I think the only way we're going to see that or realize that is to just kind of either take an example and go through it and then we could amend it as we go before we kind of waste time, you know, putting something together. Um, I don't know. Um, it's, so it's really pretty much up to the city whether they want to, you know, plan and prepare for this, which I think is what I heard from some of the city councilors that it would be a good idea to be ready for this installation, um, even though it may or may not come to now then for quite some time. But it's always better to plan for it than it is to be surprised by it and then end up with something that's not appealing to you. I mean, we can set something up based on the density too, right? I mean. People are going to start selling and developing areas, so you can't really... If you set it to a certain area, that's not going to work forever. So can you... You know, if if it's more residential and they do more of the smaller ones versus, you know, someone's got 300 acres and a bigger one would make sense out in an area like that. But you know, that was just my, my thought on it. How do you... I think it's hard to specify... 
there were a couple cities that did specify s setbacks between poles, but I think that would be hard to do with technology changing and different antenna types and right. you know what they what they really need for separation. We can't just really guess. Well, that. I don't know who, but one of them had taller and shorter ones depending on where it was put. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you? Well, that makes some sense. Like if you wanted to focus an area, you know, down here, but we don't have a lot of sidewalks where people are, you know, necessarily coming and going right here. But you know, at the same time, along the frontage road and you know, coming out of the buildings and stuff, you definitely would want, um, you know, an aesthetic look. Right. Um, part of the problem is, not necessarily a problem, but the challenge of, you know, the county road right away versus city right away, so, um, but I guess if they're in now then, but within the county road right away, I still think you have a say in how they look, is the way I understand it. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Could, can you put those on electric, or on the, on the Electrical poles that go by? Mm -hmm, yeah, they can go on top of just a regular would, wood would, pole. Would the electric company allow you to do that? Um, I Actually, believe they, they, they... I don't think they would. They won't let you put anything on their poles at all. They won't oh, they let us put our stuff on their poles. Nope. Not at all. Unless it's associated with that um, the power company's stuff or like... Um, like the phone company or cable or something like that. They're pretty particular about that. They did put the fiber optic on the lines off. But that's part of, um, what was it, Century Lake or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. And they can use those poles. But they own some of them and the power company owns some of them. Okay. But I wonder if it's possible to specify that as yeah. they replace poles that they install a certain pole that is shared. You know what I mean? Try calling Connexus or Excel. Most likely they're going to tell you no. Well, see, there's one over by your place there. It, it's a development back in an Elk River there. It, a, light, a light there. Is that, that private? That, that light is owned by them, though. They charge, like the city or whoever they put the pool upon, or um, that light on there for, a monthly fee for maintenance and electricity and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Which one are you talking about? Over in Sherburn County, right in uh, the now in Sherburn line over by his place there. There's a light, it, it, they got the development back in there and they got a light that lights up there at night. Oh, I see. Just beyond, yeah, just beyond your place on the yeah. left, okay, when you go north. What about basic level? Can we make some basic requirements if it's in the the city center that we define that boundary that it needs to be uh, combined with a light? for a potential light pole and if it's outside that it needs to be uh, <coughs> approved by the approved by the uh, planning and zoning commission prior to the uh, permitting of the and just make them file or pull a permit and then it has to be an approved design because it feels like that at least in the next few years the likelihood is fairly low that these things are going to come to now then so mm -hmm. I think if we put some general requirements that says if you want to come through the basic downtown part of now then we're going to we would like you to combine it with a light pole if it's outside the main city center mm -hmm. pull a permit and we're going to improve what the pole looks like and if it's at an area that's by a stoplight or by an intersection it would be great to have a combined Siren light or something if it's out in the middle of nowhere It may it probably won't matter what it looks like as much At least not for a while for a, yeah, it's, it's like when you read through this I mean It's like downtown heavily populated areas where they run out of coverage here. We run out of coverage because of the, the know, there's, there's the lack of network, but there's not enough people density wise to prompt the phone companies to put these things in because they're not going to get their return back.
Yeah, I mean, we could actually create a map, you know, that showed an area. Um, and it's like in this area, light poles required outside of this area. It's got to be approved by the planning and zoning when you file your permit, when you pull a permit to put these things up. I don't know that you want planning and zoning review, but or I, I think somebody. we could certainly have different parameters. Yeah. Um, because the state statute does allow, I don't know, like, I didn't bring it with me tonight, but up to 25 at a time they can put in or something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then we would at least have some general requirements in place, and then that should bridge the gap, and when, you know, all this, that would give us some control over what this what it looks like as it comes in and if it comes in a lot faster or there's a lot more requests we could we could bring it up again but I don't know that I'm right ready to put together an 18 page document for something that we may never have a <clears throat> I mean I think it would make sense to at least start with yeah someone else's not to jump on the like copy bandwagon but yeah the more these start going up, the more companies are going to start doing them and the more options we're going to have too. So, right. I mean, unless somebody wants to get stock into stealth companies, it seems like they ha seem to know what they're doing. But I think it's fair to say that we don't want them coming to us with options. It'd be nice if we had the options for them. So maybe I'll take a basic example or one that's fairly, I guess, common or, and then I can put options for height or options for, you know, different kind of where the variability is an option um, then we could have some specific things to discuss if you were oh, sorry. If, if you were to actually um, get somebody else's layout of this what they've got going on for their city mm -hmm. it would give us something to start with at least just yep. so we don't miss maybe some part of what to plan for, like we said, we may not we may not see this for quite a few years, and by the time they get here, it could be all changed. <laughs> so, just using something basic to start with, just to get us going, would be helpful. But yeah, we don't want to put too much time into something that doesn't really suit our city very, very, very well demanded right now. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of similarities between these ordinances, so um, so I've got, I've got at least, yeah, and, they're, and they are fairly similar to the League, the League of Minnesota City's example, too. Don't get me wrong, I'd love to have some better service out here, but it's going to be larger towers. Why couldn't we have something, if you figure out like an ordinance that's from other cities, that's kind of a basic framework of something, why couldn't we discuss that with the council when we um, have like a, our next meeting with them? And then we'd have some ideas that would bounce off of them also, you know, and so then, then we could figure it out from there too. So because I'm pretty sure that they probably have some other ideas going through their mind that probably doesn't go through anybody else's mind. You know, that might not be a bad idea either once we have kind of a framework of some stuff that we should have. Sure. There's going to be leg legalities and, and different legal stuff that they're going to think of that we probably will not. True. And, I mean, I don't, I don't not like your idea, although your job as a commission is generally to kind of work out, you know, get through the, take the junk out and put the heart of it in there you know, and then we can get their feedback. And, you know, our council liaison is gone tonight, but um, I'm sure we'll have, a, you know, 
several more meetings on this before we get to a, an actual final version. Um, but we certainly could if we end up having a comprehensive plan meeting or something in between, we could, you know. Just some of the basic stuff that, we, that we'd come up with on this framework because no matter what we do, they're going to change it or go against it or whatever they do anyhow, so is what I'm thinking. That well, we kind of have the same ideas. Not, you know, maybe, maybe not. We, we have a um, couple of our members that are great about coming to this meeting and hearing what y'all have to say. So it is important that you, that we kind of work through some of the details before we present it. And then we, then we present it to them and we say, well, here's why we did what we did, you know. I think having a basic outline and then kind of knowing what the differences are from city to city. Mm -hmm. And then when there is a difference, what city had what? Because, you know, we may be like Oakdale in one sense, but, you know, Rogers is over here too, and we're not going to get super fancy, but we have a commercial area and a residential area too. So just knowing... We don't need to get into legalities of it. We just need to know what we want and how we want it to look. So what is everyone else doing and what kind of area are they? Okay. I don't know. I think it's a good plan to just kind of compare what I've got for examples, compare that to the league, and then put some talking points together, um, you know, based on the various sections that an ordinance has to contain. And I mean, contractors are pretty busy, so I'm going to guess no one's calling you back because yeah, there's it stuff really going hard. on. Yeah, it was hard. I had to bug people a lot. <clears throat> okay, so you're going to bring something for us <coughs> maybe to next? Yeah, we'll, we'll aim for the next meeting for sure. Right now, I, I only know of, well, it depends on how fast our concept people get something together. But I have another concept plan that's coming in July right now. That's all I know of. Okay. And so we may have one or both of uh, tonight's discussions there as well. Okay, then, so we'll continue this discussion at our next meeting then. If I, if I could, Mr. Chair, Go ahead. just highlight a, an email that was sent out um, by the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, it says the League has received information from that at least two wireless providers have been reaching out to local leaders to request that they sign on to or send a letter to the Federal Communications Commission urging federal rulemaking on small cell wireless facilities siting. The letter is being pitched to city leaders as a way to show support for the growth and potential of 5G technology, but is being used by industry to demonstrate city support for FCC rulemaking that would harm cities. These letters can and will be used by the FCC to justify preemption from the regulations. So um, the League of Minnesota Cities was saying, we strongly urge you or your mayor to decline any request to sign this letter. So anyway, that was a concern that was highlighted. I just wanted you to be aware of. But by going through the exercises that we are, we'll help to define what we want and what is legal before we get anybody else to influence us. Okay, thanks. Okay then, is there anything, no there's nothing else on the agenda, so we're ready for the motion to adjourn. Somebody like to make that motion? A motion to adjourn. Okay. I'll second it. Okay, two commissioners here. Second. Aye.